لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا فمن يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله ما ما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته It is always an honor, it's always a privilege to be in this space. We tried to hold out for as long as we could, Sanya. I said, I don't want, I want Sanya to miss even a single hadith because she's a runner. I said this, didn't I? I said, you know, because she's been, she's been present for most of them. Um, but we did, we did do one chapter. So you missed from 322 until 328 this was last class okay mashallah okay mashallah alhamdulillah so now we've arrived to the chapter babu ma jaa fi firashi rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wasallam what has been narrated concerning the bed of the messenger of allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam you know one one friend of mine he said you know there are two things you should uh spend very Uh, liberally on he said your shoes and your bed because if you're not on one you're on the other <laughs> right so you want to right your shoes and your bed you want them both to be comfortable um we'll learn with these hadith the prophet alayhi salatu wasallam he did not have a you know he did not enjoy a very comfortable uh bed spread we have عن عائشة رضي الله عنها قالت إنما كان فراش رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم الذي ينام عليه من أدم حشوه ليف on the authority of Aisha who reported the bed on which the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم would sleep was but a tanned hide and its stuffing was a palm tree fiber right this was the bed of the prophet alayhi it was just a, ta- a tan piece of leather and it was stuffed with palm tree fibers that's it not luxurious not soft not comfortable there's another hadith that say the umar came to visit the prophet muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam the prophet was sleeping this time on a reed mat a reed mat think like um one of those straw mats right and because he was sleeping without a shirt he was wearing a lunky the lunky was up to his uh navel and his sides were exposed saying that Omar could see all of the indentations of the reed mat on the side of the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam and upon seeing this Omar started weeping he started crying and the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam looked up at him and said what are you crying for What are you crying for? Omar almost didn't want to say. What why are you crying? Mother you keep. He said the kings of this world are asleep on silk lined cushions. Right? With chamberlains standing over them, fanning them with beautiful women, feeding grapes to them. And you're God's messenger and you're asleep on a reed mat without a pillow. And the Prophet ﷺ said, "Omar, isn't it enough for you that God has given them the dunya and giving us, given us the akhirah? Like, what more? Like, what? Like, what? What more do you want? Isn't that enough for you? Right? Meaning, in addition to the fact that Allah has given us the akhirah, you want this? This is something dissatisfactory to you. This is something that bothers you. This is, this is." nothing this is you know this is a small inconvenience or small discomfort that we have in the dunya give me one second this is a small inconvenience this is a small uh, discomfort um The next hadith we have Haddathana Ja'far ibn Muhammad an abihi qala su'ilat Aisha ma kana firash Rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wasallam fi baytiki qalat min Adam hashbuhu min Eve su'ilat 
حفصتو ما كان فراش رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم في بيتك قالت مسحا تثنيه اثنتين فينام عليه فلما كان ذات ليلة قلت لو لو ثنيته أربعة ثنيات لكان أوطأ لكان أوطأ له فثنيناه له بأربعة ثنيات فلما أصبح قال ما فرشته إلى الليل قالت قلنا هو فراشك إلا أن ثنيناه بأربع ثنيات قلنا هو أوطأ لك قال ردوه لحالته لحالته الأولى فإنه من منعتني وطاءته صلاة الليل on the authority of Aisha who was asked what was the bed of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa inside your home she replied it was made from tanned hide and the stuffing was palm tree fiber same bed Hafsa another wife of the prophet sallam, was asked what was the bed of the messenger of Allah in your home she replied a coarse woolen blanket that we would fold in half and spread out for him to sleep upon. So his bed at the home of Hafsa was even less accommodating. It was even rougher, right? It was just a coarse woolen blanket that they would unfold. And the Prophet ﷺ would just sleep on that, nothing between the coarse woolen blanket and the, the ground, right? When the Messenger of Allah uh, woke up the next morning, he asked, what did you spread out for me last night? I replied, you're betting, except I folded it four times and said to myself that it would be more comfortable for you. He said, refold it as it was before. Its softness kept me from my prayer last night. La ilaha illallah, this is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Hafsa said, his bed was like a coarse woolen blanket, but she thought to herself, instead of just laying it out really uh, wide, if you fold it more times, it'll get softer, right? Now this is, I mean, these aren't even things we would consider luxuries. Think about our mattresses, right? She said, I'll fold it four times, it'll be more comfortable for him. So when he woke up, he said to her, what did you do to my bed last night? Right, he noticed that it was more comfortable. She said, it was the same bed, except I folded it more times to give it more softness. <clears throat> he said, return it to the way it was before because the softness of the bedspread, it kept me from my prayers last night. SubhanAllah. Now, we're actually in the process of buying a new mattress, right? I seriously, in fact, I don't need to doubt. I know that as I was testing mattresses, I wasn't saying, oh, this one is too soft. It'll keep me from my pain or late. If you give me this one, I won't be able to wake up and pray. No, we want the most comfortable. The one that I will be able to sleep soundest in, that's the bed that I want. The Prophet, his was not a focus on the luxuries and the frivolities of this world. This bed is too soft for me, right? This bed is so uh, uh, soft, I won't be able to sleep at night, right? This bed is too soft for me. Right? SubhanAllah. What has been narrated concerning the humility of the Messenger of Allah? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, the saying is Men Whoever lowers herself for the sake of Allah, Allah will raise her. Whoever lowers himself for the sake of Allah, Allah will raise him. Right, tawadu'a. The best definition I've heard of tawadu'a is claiming less for yourself than you actually think you deserve, especially in terms of praise, right? So if you really think or it occurs to you, I'm the best this or that, you don't actually say that. That's humility. Even if you think I'm this, I'm that, you don't actually say I'm this and I'm that. You know, if I am, Allah knows, but I choose to refrain from saying it. 
That's too long. I won't say that I am. They say to claim for yourself things that you aren't even entitled to, right? To, to claim things unjustifiably. This isn't even what we would call arrogance. This is what we would call being supercilious, which is the super silly word, right? Supercilious. A person that claims things for themselves and that's not even real. That's not even real. It's bad enough to actually say what you really think about yourself. You know, I am the most, of all the teachers in Chicago, I am the most handsome. I'm just, I'm just saying, I'm just, just to be like, if we're going to be honest about it, that, even that, it's a violation of Tuala. If you thought that, right? Here we have an entire chapter on the Tuala, on the humility of the Prophet, and it is worth mentioning that the chapter on his humility comes after the chapter on his bedding. Because the idea is that in order to endure what he endured in terms of how he slept, how he ate, he must have had a very humble opinion of himself. Otherwise, he would have said, what, I'm entitled to better than this. You expect me to sleep on what? You want me to eat what? You know, it's mentioned that the Prophet ﷺ would even respond to invitations from the poorest of his companions. And he never complained about what he was served. Now, he didn't eat everything that he was served. You know, on one occasion, they served him a grilled lizard. He looked at him. They said, Ya Rasulullah, is there something wrong with this lizard? Like, is it haram? He said, no, it's not haram. It's just not my preference. He said, okay. <laughs> Right, But he responded to the invitations of even his most, uh, um, uh, his poorest companions, right? Right. Prophet was on the authority of Amr ibn al-Khattab. The Messenger of Allah said, do not go to excessive lengths in praising me the way that Christians did the son of Mary. If you mention me, say I am the servant of God and his messenger. Do not exaggerate my rank. Do not exaggerate my status. In the way the Christians exaggerated the status of Isa ibn Umar, Jesus the son of Mary. If you mention me, mention that I am the servant of God and mention that I am the messenger of God. Right? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and very few people know this, he at different points was referred to by about 99 names. Like, you know, the 99 names of Allah, there are also 99 names of Rasulullah. Yasin, Taha, Ahmed. Right? I mean, many, we can go on and on and on. But of all of the names that the Prophet وسلم, was referred to by, the name that he felt most honored by was Abdullah, servant of Allah. That was the name that. And then, you know, it, it, you know, you have surahs of the Quran. We call we call these uh, surahs the um, sabahin, or the surahs that begin with Subhanallah. Right? They begin with Subhanallah, like Surah Al Isra. Usually, when Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala begins with His glory, Subhanallah, Subhanallah, the Asra bi Abdi, glory be to God. Who journey? Who took his servant on a journey by night? Right. The Prophet ﷺ is referred to as the servant of Allah. This is his honor. This is his dignity. You know. And this was something that Quraysh they really did not like. This. You know. Uh, you have uh, hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that indicate what they disliked most about the prayer was that you had to go down on your face. They said it is unbecoming of a member of Quraysh to grovel on the ground like that, to put his face on the ground. That's, we're more noble than that. We're more dignified than that. That we would 
you know, you worship Allah, you, you make salah around the God, but you don't have to put your face on the ground. You want me to put the highest part of my anatomy on the ground? But actually, the Prophet said, The closest the servant comes to Allah is in such the, is in prostration. Right? And this is a hadith that we also mention to people that are bound to very strict textual literalism. If Allah is up above the sky, then how are we closest to him when we're on the ground? But of course, the Prophet ﷺ is talking about what? Closeness in your state. The closest you will ever be to God in your state is in your sujood, in your prostration. Right? This is also a very good time to make dua. Right? Of course, we go to Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la. Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la. Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la. Right? Glory be to my Lord, the highest. And then you make dua. You ask Allah for what you want. Ask him then because this is when you're closest to him. Right? Even when the Prophet وسلم, is doing the Isra the Mi'raj. Right? Has the Isra. Travels from Mecca to Beit al maqdis to present-day Jerusalem. Then he ascends the heavens out at the Temple Mount. He enters the direct presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning without any barrier. He leaves the direct presence of Allah, right? This is when God gives him the prayer. Why? To answer the longing that the Prophet ﷺ felt for that presence. Anything that we experience as a pleasure, as a joy, once it fades, we long to experience it again. I want it again. The prophet was in the direct presence of Allah. He leaves the direct presence of Allah. He's given the prayer. This is how you can get close to what you were experiencing in the prayer, right? And yet the prophet alayhi salam, he says, don't go to excessive lengths in praising. Right? I think it's very important for us to see the humanity of the Prophet ﷺ. If we are to benefit from his example, if we make him something godlike or angelic, how can a human being benefit from an angel if he's angelic? Only when we recognize, oh, this is a, a, a human like us. He feels frustration. He feels grief. He experiences loss. Right? He has even, uh, you know, there's a, there's a verse in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if it were not for God strengthening you, you would have inclined toward them a little bit. Like, that's one of those eyes. We read it really quickly and we don't think about it. Say what? Money, power influence they are attractive and that if it weren't for God strengthening you you would have conceded something to Quraysh uh, okay maybe we can uh, work something out you know what what you're saying isn't so bad right this is not this is the humanity of the prophet it's there only then do you see what it means to be a great human being Right? If you make the Prophet وسلم, into an angel, you're unable to benefit from his example. Only when you see him as someone that is subject to all of the human experience in the way that you are. But he rose above that experience to be the best of creation. You know, the Prophet وسلم, was sitting with Aisha and he said, Aisha, everybody has a personal shaitan that accompanies him, accompanies her, knows him or her, and invites him or her to do evil things, right? And um, Sayyidina Aisha, عنها, she asked a very important question. She said, even you? What about you? Right? She was always asking questions like that. What about you? Do you have a personal shaitan as well? The Prophet said, yes, even me. 
But I have overcome my personal shaitan. So now he only encourages me to do good. SubhanAllah. Now, I realize this is a hadith that said, don't excessively praise me. Right? Don't call me God. Don't call me a demigod. Don't say that I'm divine. But I got to say it. If you're practice, practicing Islam so beautifully that the shaitan, a shaitan, reconsiders his shaitaniya. A shaitan says, you know, I've been thinking about this whole devil thing. You know, maybe there's more to life than this. I'm kind, of, I'm kind of watching what you're doing and thinking, maybe I want to take that up. Right? That's the way the Prophet alayhi sallam is practicing Islam. Right? Next hadith. An Anas ibn Malik radiyallahu anhu anna imra'atan ja'at ila nabiyy sallallahu alayhi sallam faqalat lahu inna li ilayka hajatan faqala ijlisi fi ayyi tariq al-madina shitti ijlisi ilayk ajlis ajlis ilayk wow mashallah this is just this is just a beautiful hadith this is a beautiful hadith right a woman on the authority of Anas ibn Malik who reported, listen very closely to this hadith. A woman came to the Prophet وسلم, and said to him, I have a need that I need to ask of you. The Prophet وسلم, said to her, sit on any street of Medina you wish and I will come and sit with you. Right? Some of my friends that work in community service, work in social work, they say this is the hadith for them. That the Prophet alayhi salam, she said, I have a need, of, I have a need of you. I need something from you. He didn't even make her specify what the need was. What do you need? How many people I like if I call you say I said I need something, what's the first thing you say? What? What is it? What do you need? Because you don't know what maybe I can furnish your need, maybe I can. Maybe I can respond to your need. Maybe I can. The Prophet just said no. You can sit on any street in Medina. I'll come find you. They say, that's the second principle. You don't make the person in need of service come to you. Maybe they're unable to come to you. He didn't tell her, what well, you have a need. You see that house down there? That's my house. Come there and we'll make sure you get what you need. You see that? This is my, these are my office hours. Come to my office. And I'll make sure you get what you need. You know, you can sit anywhere you want. I'll come find you. That is service. It's like, you know, uh, they say most interesting man in the world, his car just says, I'll call you. <laughs> right? You don't have to come to me. I'll come to you. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. The second thing that they extract from this hadith is he said, Ijli si. He said, sit in any place you want. I'll come sit with you. That the idea is what? I'll be with you as you go through your trial. Not that I'm going to come, you know, uh, fix this and leave. No, no. I'll come sit with you. You know, the Prophet, والسلام, he said in a hadith, he said, love those that have been given less than you and sit with them. Sit with them. Love those that have been given less than you and sit with them. It's not enough just to say, hey, I don't know anything about those people. But I send a check over there. Every year I send a little Southern code over there, but I don't know them. Right? I don't want to be associated with them, but I send a check down there. No. The association is actually more beneficial than the check. Because in the association, we come to recognize what our shared humanity. We're not altogether different. Right? We're not altogether different. And it's not that I am in any definitive way better than you. It's just that this is my test and this is your test. This is what comes to that association. MashaAllah. 
ما شاء الله عن انس ابن مالك رضي الله عنه قال كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يعود المرضى ويشهد الجنائز ويركب الحمار ويجيب دعوة العبد وكان يوما بين قريضة على حمار وكان يوما بين قريضة على حمار محفو مختوم بحبل من ليف وعليه إكاف من ليف On the authority of Anas ibn Malik who reported the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would visit the sick. He would attend funeral processions and he would ride on a donkey and he would accept the invitations of people in bondage, people that were slaves. On the day of the siege of Banu Quraidha, he was riding on a donkey whose rein and saddle were made of palm fiber. Few things here. One, the Prophet وسلم, would visit sick people, right? He wasn't too busy for that. This is why they mentioned this in the chapter of his humility. He never said, you know, I have too much going to do that. It's like somebody else, uh, so-and-so is sick. Can somebody, somebody go visit him? He would go himself. He would walk in janazah. If somebody died and they had a janazah, he would walk in the procession. A Jewish funeral procession came by and the Prophet stood up to honor it. The companion said, Ya Rasulullah, what agin who you hoodie? Oh, Messenger of God, it's a Jew. That's, that's, that, that's not the funeral procession of a Muslim, it's a Jew. The Prophet said, What Allah said he enough? Is it not a human soul? Is it not a human soul? Alay Satiyat Nafs? Is it not a soul? God gave a life and God took one. It's a solemn occasion. Is it not a soul? Right? Then they mention, and this is hard on me, that the Prophet he used to ride donkeys. Now, in the culture of the Arabs, donkeys were for women and children. Men that were properly in touch with their machismo, they rode camels and horses, right? They rode camels and they rode horses. Men did not ride baghan, himab. They didn't ride donkeys. That was seen as like unmacho, like, you know, you know even now, some men won't say it. But when men go to look at cars, they look at certain cars, it's not a woman's car. Uh, that's a woman's car. That's a, that's a car for a woman. Right? I, can't, I can't drive that. That's, that's a woman's car. When he says that, what, 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 do you think, what, do you, what do you think that means? When a man says, ah, that's a woman's car. Ah, that's a woman's car. What, is that, what do you think that means, honey? Could mean that it's smaller. Could mean that something about it's styling. Could mean, I don't know. It it doesn't convey enough masculine, <clears throat> whatever that is, right? It doesn't have the curb appeal of something that a man would drive. And some of us have to be reminded the Prophet وسلم, intentionally. Um, he would intentionally challenge some of their notions of machismo, masculinity, toughness, intentionally, right? So when we, when we see that hadith, where a man comes to the Prophet the man has 10 children with him. The man, the, oh, the man is the father to 10 children. A little boy comes to ask the Prophet, at least I was for something. The Prophet rubs the head of the little boy and then kisses the little boy's head. And the man says, to all that, you kiss kids. He said that like you do this in public because you know one commentator he said even back then men would you know uh, love and kiss 
and be very affectionate with their children in private. But it wasn't something a man did publicly. Publicly, it's like, I don't do that. Publicly, I'm told, stand up. Jesse, get over here. Prophet, the prophet said, yes, I kiss children. And then he said, what do I have to offer in Islam to somebody that has no mercy in their heart? Almost as if to say, what good is there in somebody who doesn't kiss children? You don't kiss children. Something is wrong with you. Nothing is wrong with me. Those are definitely my children. And right now I'm thinking not about kissing them, but something else. Right? Yeah, you know, right? You kiss children. Right? The Prophet, alayhi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he ever had this hadith. Y'all a couple of he would ride a donkey. Right? Because he wasn't, you know, they say that men that are very comfortable with who they are as men don't feel a need to prove who they are as men. I'm very comfortable with who I am. I don't. I don't have. To, I, I don't have anything to prove, right? I'm, I'm comfortable with who I am. Do you think it's going to change because of what I'm writing? That my status as a man is going to somehow change because I'm riding a donkey? Not for anybody who's comfortable with who they are, right? But it's still mentioned here in the chapter of the humility of the Prophet And then it says, when you abd, he would respond to the invitations of enslaved persons. So even if somebody had the lowest social status in that society, if they said, Ya Rasulullah, come have dinner with me, he would say, absolutely. Just tell me when. Sure, absolutely. He wouldn't say, you live in Inglewood. Yeah, so long. come have dinner with me. You live in Austin. No, you come have dinner with me. <laughs> you know, come, come have. Is it Eugene will down with an island? He would respond to their invitation. Where do we? You live on you live on you live on Shane Knife and Road. You come have dinner with me. How about that? No, no, I, I'll come over. I'll come over. And you know, class difference. Class difference is significant. Because when you go and you dine with somebody that is from a different, you know, socioeconomic background than yourself, things are going to be different, maybe. Right? The food changes, the beverages they change. Right? You know, it's, it's you know, and 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 and, and it, it, it takes great um Somebody comes to you and they, they attempt to offer you their best. And they give you this. You said, I'm sorry, I, I only eat organic. Are these, are these free range eggs? You'll have to excuse me. Wait a minute. I don't drink anything with high fructose corn syrup. Do you just have water? Now, now certain things I'll, I'll say. You know, I, I know they don't drink soda. Can you give me some water? But there's certain things I'm not going to comment on the quality that I'm accustomed to. I just don't think that's prophetic. They say the Prophet وسلم, never complained about food. Never. Right. So if you're answering uh, the dinner invitation of somebody enslaved, that means that night you're going to be eating like a slave. This is what this is what we eat for dinner. And you're not going to say, uh, ooh, what's that? Oh, man. Uh, are these juicy red apples? I only eat gala apples. Oh. Probably should have informed you beforehand. <laughs> ooh. Yikes. Should have, should have informed you beforehand. Oh, my God. Is that? Are those? You said let's have breakfast. Those aren't freshly made Belgian waffles. Those are Eggos, aren't they? Oh, sorry, I don't, don't eat Eggos. Sorry about that. But if you want to go on over to, uh, you know, yo, we can, we can head over now if you want. <laughs> you know, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, no, no, no. This is not the Sunnah of the Prophet, right? You jeeb will die with an right? 
وكان يوم بني قريبة على حمار مختوم بحبل من ضيف and the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام you know the saddle of the saddle of your riding animal in the ancient world that was like the interior of your car right a person that you know like every society people have uh, status symbols things that even if they aren't garish or um, gaudy, they convey to people around you your social status. You know, a lot of men say watches are like that. Right? You see a certain watch, you know, he may be dressed very, very modestly. When you see that wristwatch, you know, oh, right, this is, this is a person of, uh, you know, substantial means, right? In the ancient world, it was the saddle, the armor, a certain kind of armor. And you know, the best swords came from India. That's actually, actually the Arabs, you know, what, what's interesting about the Arabs, they had an obsession with India because of spices. India was the home of spices. And so people with the trade route, it went from the Arabian Peninsula to India. And the people that traded in spices, they would return. Assalamu alaikum. How are you, Asma? Very good to see you, Asma. You always say, what's my name? Asma. Okay, mashallah, okay. You know, um, they would return from India, not only with spices, but with all kinds of things the Arabs had never seen. Because Indians were just in a different place in terms of their civilization. There all kinds of stuff the Arabs had never seen before. This is why they started naming their children, both men and women, Hind. When you when someone's named Hind, Hind is India, right? Because for them, Hind was the source of everything beautiful. Right? If you if you say Hind, that means it's good, right? This child is born with you, Hind. That means they, they call it Hind is good. You never you never knew that connection. That's why. You know, they would name the children, you, but you probably know people named Hind. Like Hind, like Hind Naki, right? When the Arabs named their children Hind is because India is the source of all good things, right? Spices, metals, all kinds of things, right? So the armor, this was a way that a person's status was known. When you saw their armor, the way the sword was made, the hilt, the sheath, Ah, oh, this, this, is a, this is a very wealthy person, right? The clothing, etc. One of those things was the saddle. And they mentioned that the saddle of the Prophet, the riding animal itself, right? The saddle of the Prophet wasn't very impressive, right? It was just, it was, a, you know, it was just a, a basic tan leather saddle. It wasn't anything that was uh, eye-catching. Wow, look at that saddle. Was there anything eye catching in that way? Right? MashaAllah. ibn Malik قال كان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يدعى إلى خبز الشعير والإهالة النسيخة سنخة فيجيب ولقد كان له درع عند يهودي فما وجد ما يكفها حتى مات. سبحان الله. SubhanAllah. It said that the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, would be invited to a meal of barley bread and aged oil. Right? I'm going to do that to one of my friends just to see how they respond. Hey man, come have dinner. At my house. He comes over, bread, oil. He's like, MashaAllah, man, nice appetizer, man. That was the dinner. That was the dinner. You invite me over here to eat bread, some fosia bread, and this wasn't even fosia. This was barley. This is what we call Aish Belady, simple bread. You invited me to your house. You mean I got in my car, drove across town to enjoy a meal with you, and it was bread and oil. There are people who would storm out of our homes feeling disrespected, feeling dishonored. 
You invited me to eat and you served me bread and olive oil. That's the meal? Man, that's the meal. I know people that if I did that, they would think I was joking. But I was like, you know, I put a little oil there, a saucer, bread there, bon appetit. They would look at me. Is this a joke? This is what we're eating tonight, right? He would be invited to a meal of barley bread and aged oil. He would respond. He said, he had some armor, which he had with a Jew as collateral. And he did not find the money to get it back until he passed away. Let me say that again, man. Some of y'all, some, some, some of us don't understand what this, why this, what this hadith means. Some of you are like, what do you? Jews have always worked in the pawn industry. And this is this is this is an ancient custom of Jewish people. They've always been involved in uh, that kind of uh, industry, pawning. In Medina, Jews ran a pawn shop, right? The Prophet وسلم, needed some money. So he took his shield and he pawned it to get a loan from the Jew. Yeah, take this. The Prophet والسلام, could never find the money he needed to get his shield back, to get his armor back, his dirah until he, he died, the first money, the only, because you know, prophets don't leave behind inheritance. The only thing they did was pay the Jew and got, got the shield of the prophet. Son. Now I want you to imagine this. This is in Medina. At this time, the prophet وسلم, is the sovereign ruler of Arabia. He is, for all intents and purposes, the sovereign ruler of all of Arabia. And he has to borrow money for somebody, from someone. And he has to put up collateral. Now, at any point, he could have went to that person and said, what? What, what, do, what, do, what do rulers, kings, dictators, what do they do when somebody has something they want? They demand it. Give me this. Right? You're here because I allow you to be here. I can have the Muslims kill you if I wanted to. Man, give me that. Give me, give me this money, man. I'm a strong arm. Right? The Prophet وسلم, did not have a toxically authoritarian bone in his body. He wasn't like that. He wasn't like that. And even the, now he's a ruler of a polity, even the money in his possession is used what? In service of the community. It's not, it's not to enrich my. Whenever you read something in the Quran or in the hadith of the Prophet about the spoils of war, this portion going to the Messenger of Allah, doesn't go in his pocket. Thinking like, yeah, let me get my portion so I can go off and, uh... yes, amen. Can you share a little bit? The Prophet he said, the prophets don't leave behind in, like monetary inheritance. What they leave behind is knowledge, right? Just the prophets, right? Other people were commanded to leave behind inheritance. You know, Sayyidina Abu Bakr at one point wanted to give away all of his money, all of it. Sayyidina Abu Bakr, his faith was just like that. He was just, he was a one of a kind kind of person, right? So when he was, when he was uh, you know, Planning his estate, he said, "You know, I give, I give, I give all of it away." The prophet said, "Yeah, I buy back a third. Only give away a third. What fudu kathir? A third is a lot, meaning only give away a third, and even a third comes close to harming your heirs. Like Allah has given these people a legitimate right to inherit from you. If you give away everything that should be theirs, that kind of injures them a little bit." I kind of puts them in a tough position. Allah gave that to them, your children, right? Your wives, Allah gave that to them. If you give it all away, 
you kind of hurt, you kind of put them in a tough position. So if you must only give away a third, and even a third is a lot, right? To give a th even a third of your wealth in charity before you die, you know, it's kind of like, you know, as you're, as you're planning the will, your son is looking at you. Dad, I know you're a righteous man, but come on. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Dad, just come on, Dad. You know, it's my turn. Right? Your daughter is looking at you. Mom, I know you're a good woman, but it's my turn. Right? Even a third is a lot. Right? But the prophets, I lay the prophets don't believe, they don't leave behind monetary inheritance. What they leave is knowledge. Right? The other thing that the prophet, you know, the, the people, a lot of people brag about being Sayyids, being Adam Bait, this person Adam Bait, that person Adam Bait. Interesting feature, this is true across the schools of Islamic law. The Shurafa cannot receive zakat, no matter how poor they are. The family of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, cannot be given our zakat money. Right? Why? Because the Prophet wants the community to know this is not about establishing my family as a dynasty. Not that it takes your money. Right? There's, in terms of the Ahlul Bayt as a source of guidance for us, sure, this is not about my family taking the community's money from now until Yom al Qiyamah. That's not what this is about. This isn't about that. This is, I'm not trying to install my family as people who take the community's money. Right? Ahlul Bayt cannot receive zakat. Right? So you see, you see a lot of this. The Prophet والسلام, working within that tribal structure wants to establish his impartiality, his fairness. And this, you know, because think about this, man. A lot of us don't think about the context of the Sira. These are people wedded to a tribal reality. You have tribes and tribal chiefs. The Prophet وسلم, is becoming like a super chief. Right? Meaning like, but they still belong to tribes, even after they become Muslim. But he's trying to establish himself as being, I'm above the chiefs. I'm above them. I'm, your, your, your allegiance to me, your loyalty to me supersedes your loyalty to any, anybody else. Right? Now that you're a Muslim. One of the ways that he has to win their confidence is I'm not, I'm not, I'm not doing this to get your money. I'm not trying to take anything from you. I'm not, I'm not I'm not interested in taking anything from you. It's not, that's right. And anything I ask you to give me, it is not enriching me personally. Right? Because I have to give things to the Prophet. It's not to enrich me. It's so that I can fulfill my function of supporting the community. That's what, it, so when I ask you for some of the spoils of war or for some of your grain, some of your crop, it is not that I put this in my bank account and tell Aisha, man, this Islam thing is really working out for us, man. It's really working. It's because I have people day and night coming to me asking for money. And I have to be able to give it to them. I have people day and night getting into uh, difficult financial positions. I have to be able to bail them out. And that's why, you know, some people say a leader, a true leader, can never afford to be broke. Can never afford to be broke. A true leader cannot be broke because there's too many people that I have to serve. I get a call every day. Yo, I'm about to get evicted. They're gonna call me. Yo, car just got impounded. Won't be able to get to work tomorrow if I don't get it out of the pound. How much is it gonna be? $436. I need it now, baby. Now I have to be able to. Uh, a leader cannot afford to be broke. Bismillah. A few more here. An Anas ibn Malik. رضي الله عن قال حج رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم على رحل رفد وعليه قطيفة لا تساوي أربعة دراهم قال اللهم اجعل حجا لا رياء فيه 
wala sum'ata subhanallah on the authority of, authority of Anas ibn Malik who reported the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam performed the hajj while riding a mount with a dry worn out saddle topped with a threadbare woolen blanket that had to be worth less than four dirhams, four bucks, right? So that the Prophet again, you notice what? They're focusing on the saddle. They're focusing on the saddle. It was a very simple saddle. And it was topped with a threadbare woolen blanket. Let to saddle with arba'at al It probably wasn't worth four bucks. This is the messenger of Allah making hajj. And the Prophet so I said them noticing, I mean, this is, you know, man, I love reading this collection. And oh my God, I'm sad because, see this? This is what we've covered. This is what we have to go. All right, so we're, we're actually coming to the end of this book of Hadith. Um, the Prophet notices them checking him out, sizing him up. You know, like you're checking somebody in your life. That is a really cheap saddle. <laughs> you know, like, that is not very nice looking. And it's topped with a wool blanket that you can see it threads. What does he pray? Allahumma ja'alhu hajjan la riya'a fi wa la suma'ata. He notices them checking him out. What does he do? Oh Allah, make it a hajj that has no showing off in it. Right? Make it a hajj, wala sum'ata. Make it a hajj through which one does not seek reputation. Right? Make it, make it a hajj that there's no showing off in my hajj. Right? Make it a hajj that one is not seeking reputation. Right? And that it was a dua to Allah, but it kind of also put them in their place. Right? They're looking at him, they're checking him out. And you know when somebody is kind of sizing you up and pitying you, that's your car. Okay. Those. All right. All right. Allahumma ja'alhu hajjan la riya'a fi wa la sum'ata. Oh Allah, make it a hajj, make it a pilgrimage that has no showing off in it. And make it a pilgrimage through which one does not seek reputation over things, over things like that. Right? MashaAllah. The next hadith is like super long. So we'll stop there, inshaAllah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I'm going to call this hadith. I'm going to call this hadith. And I'm going to call this hadith. And I'm going to call this hadith. Any questions, comments, ideas? I'm just responding to it. Yes. Just like a lot. There's one uh, person you said uh saw a lot without hijab in the Yes. No, so he was in the direct presence of Allah. Okay. So we're in the presence of Allah, but we're not in the direct presence of Allah. Meaning Musa alayhi salam, he said to Allah in the Quran, Surah Al Qasas, my Lord. Let me experience you with nothing between us. And Allah says, what? Look to the mountain. Look to the mountain. Allah made some of his jalala, some of his uh, magnificence manifest to the mountain. The mountain fell flat, crumbled, right? Musa also swooned. He also fell, right? They say that in this case, Musa was murid. He wanted that direct presence of Allah, but he could not handle it. His, his heart, he could not handle it. The Prophet ﷺ was murad. He was brought into that presence of Allah, and his heart could handle it. So it wasn't like a, a, a physical, you know, Aisha, who was a scholar. Aisha said about this verse in Surah Al-Najm, she said, I hate when people say he saw Allah. She said that after the, the, the death of the Prophet. She said, I hate when I hear people say he looked at like he saw Allah like Allah something physical. 
I hate when when people say he saw Allah. He was in the direct presence of Allah. So, so can you expand on that? Why Musa is called the name of Allah? Mm. But Allah also is called. Is that so why? Is Mm. And whether is Jesus also given the same sort of title or not? People also confuse the same concept. So Musa is called Kalim Allah because this is a distinction of Musa's. Allah spoke to him directly. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to the Prophet alayhi salam, usually though, in terms of revelation, through the medium of Jibreel. He did have this, the Isra, the Mi'raj experience with Allah. But usually when Allah addressed the Prophet والسلام, he would address him through true visions. He would address him through his dreams. He would address him through the angel Jibreel والسلام. When Allah spoke to Musa, giving Musa revelation, he would give it directly to him. This is why he's called Kalim Allah. Without, he, without Jibreel. Without Jibreel. Oh. Right. Isa is called Ruhullah, the spirit of Allah. Because Isa is mentioned as a spirit that God cast into the womb of Mary. He's mentioned as a spirit. And it's also interesting that if you look at the life of Jesus, it has almost no like worldly component to it. When you say this is a problem, no, no, it's a well, a word and a spirit. Ruhu yulqa. He was a spirit cast into the womb of Mary. A spirit from Allah cast into the, the womb of Mary. Now, all of us have arwah. We have we have spirits. We have we have we have spirits, right? Um, but because Isa didn't have um, uh, a male. Uh, the word is progenitor, but like a male intermediary to bring him into existence in the way that we were all brought into existence. He was mentioned that his ruh was put directly into the womb of Mary, right? So he's sometimes referred to ruh Allah, not the spirit of God. There's a, not, but the spirit honored by God, the spirit cast by God because he was cast directly into the womb. You know, Ibrahim is called what? Khalil Allah, the close, intimate friend of Allah, right? That that he was, um, what was what was notable about uh, Ibrahim was that he was close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They, they had a, a, a relationship of deep friendship and intimacy. The Prophet Muhammad, alayhi wasalam, his title was Habib Allah. The one loved by Allah. That you know, when when the Prophet وسلم, is given that kind of honorific title, it's Habibullah, he was loved by Allah. Right? You know, Habibullah Mustafa, the chosen, the one loved by Allah. So many of the, the, the prophets they have these these honorifics. MashaAllah. Other questions, ideas? Sanya, Sanya, you're still on pace. You're still on pace, mashallah. You did listen to the other, the class. Okay, so you're still on pace, inshallah. I'm going, to, I'm going to have the certificate ready, inshallah. Other question? I said, you had a question? Is it, um... Yeah, yeah, no, no. I think, I think, I think. Now, mind you, you know who I am. I'm a car lover, <laughs> right now, now, now. Now, I think they're mentioning this not to say he rejected nice rides or riding camel or riding horses. The Prophet Ali you know, said in an authentic hadith. There will always be good in horses. He loved horses. You know, he loved horses. I think what they're saying in these hadith is he didn't see it as something beneath him to do. You know, which would be like, let's say, you know, um, like, and, and, and I've experienced this. You know, if I can speak to this uh, 
personally. Um, I travel for work and I teach and I lecture in other cities. And I've been picked up from airports and train stations in every kind of car you can think about. I've been picked up in very, very nice cars and I've been picked up in some, some very, very old cars, no air conditioning. You know, the, the floor is beginning to rot out. What they're saying is that the Prophet would get into that car just like he would get into that. It wasn't, it wasn't like he would come to the old car and say, oh, whoa, I don't ride in this. Why did you pick me up in this thing, right? The same way that somebody comes and picks me up, if they're driving a Bentley, I would jump, I would jump in and enjoy their company in the same exact way while making no mention of the car. If they were driving uh, something else, whatever, whatever is the opposite of a bit, doesn't make, make doesn't make difference. To me. You know, it's just like, um, you know, and some and I, some people think that people that like uh, really value having a comfortable car, a nice car, whatever, that like this is a part of like their identity. You know, uh, once I left my car with a friend, and he gave me his old, you know, beater. And I pulled up to Ted Leaf to do the class. And Emil Felton said, you driving that? I said, yeah, I have another car and I sold it. He said, no, I was just kidding. I shouldn't, I shouldn't have lied, stuck for him. I said, yeah, man, so I'm driving this now. He just like, can you just pull up in that? I, if Allah gives me a, a means to get around, I appreciate it. Whether it's old, new, fast, slow, big, small, rusty, so I think they're not saying that the prophet never had a, 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 a fast horse, but he never had a strong camel. His camel was named Qaswa, and it was known for its endurance and speed. You know, they used to race their camels. The prophet's camel would always win. Right? It was known for its endurance. It was known for its speed. But if he had to run an errand, he wasn't above riding a donkey. All of these ideas that, no, no, a, a man doesn't do that. I don't care about that stuff, man. Like, that's what these hadith are saying. I don't care about that. Whatever, right? And I think that, um, you know, the, the setting the setting is, is also relevant to, to, to these distinctions. Would the prophet have marched to Bedr on a donkey? Probably not. Right? Do I want the enemy to see me sitting on a little donkey? They're sitting on these huge horses, right? These Arabian steeds, and they I come to the battle, I'm sitting on a donkey. And so they think, oh no, we're definitely gonna beat them. Look, look at him. He's, he's a contemptible wretch. We got this. No, no. Maybe on that occasion, I'm also on my best horse. Right? But just running an errand around Medina, I'll take a donkey with this. All these other videos are, even if I'm in, he was on a donkey. Really? Yeah, and Hunayn, I thought he was on a donkey. Yeah, he was holding the rain. And at Hunayn, I know he was on a donkey. Right, so even then, MashaAllah, Jazakallah, Khayn, Zadakallah, Ilman, even going to a battle, I'm not a donkey, the victory comes from Allah. Maybe they will look at me and say, oh my God, he's on a donkey. You know, a donkey is considerably smaller than a horse. And it's not nearly as majestic. You know, a horse has a certain majesty. It just does. But interesting thing is that when the all of the way, he was saying, I'm gonna be like not so much but he was actually smiling the movie. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, is it when he was um, you know, that statement, people said there was two things that the prophet was establishing in that statement. He says, and an be Allah. Be like Kevin. I am the messenger of God, it is no lie. And I always say that there have been many charlatans in history, people who pretended to be something they weren't. But they usually came to terms with the truth when they were about to die. So people talk about uh, Jim Jones, the people who drank the Kool Aid, right? This, this group, the, the, the uh, what was the name of his branch of idiots, right? No, that was that was Waco, Texas. But Jim Jones, they say that he was telling his, they, he mixed the, the drink with cyanide and all of his 
followers, they drank it. But he didn't drink it. He didn't drink it. He was telling them this is an elixir from heaven. It's going to save us. They all drank it and died. They believed. They drank it and died. But he didn't drink it. Right? That's actually where the expression drank the Kool-Aid comes from. Right? They drank it. But he didn't drink it. The prophet is walking to Bethel. And at this point, they are sure we're going to be killed. And he's saying what? And the Rasulullah be like Kendall. I'm the messenger of Allah. It is no lie. It is no lie. Even right now, staring at my mortality, it's not a lie. And then he says, ibn Abdul Muttalib. Now, this is also very interesting. And maybe you'll appreciate this point. Abdul Muttalib was not a Muslim. But Abdul Muttalib was a great Arab, like uh cultural hero. He was someone that they admired. So the Prophet was in a sense saying what? Not only am I Muslim, I'm more Qurayshi than you are. Meaning like, you're fighting me thinking that through protecting paganism, you're protecting like the Quraysh's cultural heritage. I'm more entitled to that history than you are. So it's like when African Americans see people waving flags and say, well, my ancestors built this country. That's a real thing. Meaning, no, yes, we kneel for the national anthem. No, we don't stand for the Star Spangled Banner. And you think that I have some uh, issue of belonging to America? No, my ancestors built America. If anybody would feel a connection to the country, it would be me. But I recognize that America has social problems. That's what he was saying. And, Abdul, and Ibn Abdul Muttalib. I, I am the son of Abdul Muttalib. What are you talking about? Right. So beautiful hadith today, mashallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim al-Asr. Inna l-insana la fi khusr. Inna l-adina amadu wa amilu salihati wa tuwasul haqqi wa tuwasul sabr. Ameen ya rabbil alameen. Jazakumullah khil khayyar.